Thank you all for being here and for being on Zoom. Candidly, or full disclosure, this was not the initial topic that Rabbi Ethan Tucker and I had thought about for this year's lecture, but that was before October 7th. Um, and after October 7th and the nightmare that has ensued, it felt impossible to really talk about anything else, or the nightmare that was October 7th and, and everything else that's ensued. Um, my dad first went to Israel in 1960 when he was 10 years old, and he spent a summer living with cousins in Haifa. And I remember now, like I can even think of him saying it, imitating the watermelon vendor who was selling fresh watermelon off, you know, I guess just cutting it. Like he would say, al hasakin avatiach, sukar matok, adom avatiach, like a watermelon right off the knife, sweet red watermelon. And so I, I mean, my dad, my dad loved Israel. Our first family trip was in 1992 when I was 10 years old. And I remember him crying as the plane was landing, you know, like you, you see the, the Mediterranean like hitting the beach in Tel Aviv, Yafo. And I remember him crying as the plane was landing to be there with the family and to be there with my brother and me and my mom, though they had traveled before. And we went for a month, I think, or I say, we like saw every last mosaic ever. Um, and I remember like going through the old city or Tsipori or wherever it was and he'd touch a stone. He was an amateur historian. He was actually a physician and he would touch a stone and he would say, M, this stone was touched by our ancestors 2,000 years ago. And I was 10 and I'm now the mother of a 10 year old and like I can see my son rolling his eyes so back, far back in his head if I were to say that and I definitely did the same. And yet that like, it sticks with me, right? So even if I was rolling my eyes then like, I think about that now all the time. And we were so lucky to have so many family trips together. And he came to learn with me in yeshiva during my, my gap year in Israel and during the second Antifada. And um, at the end of his life, literally, uh, he was in hospice for two weeks in our home. And he would ask, the only thing he would ask about from a news perspective was, what's the news in Israel? And it was 2007. and so. There wasn't much, I guess, that made the news, but I remember every day he would say, um, what, what's the news in Israel? And last, a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, we celebrated his 16th yurt site, celebrated, commemorated, and my aunt, who's here, his sister, said, you know, um, you always say he missed so much, and he did and has, and I'm so glad, though, he's missed October 7th and the horrors that were of October 7th, um, because, the, I mean, the heartbreak for all of us, and certainly the heartbreak for him, I just, I can't imagine. Um, and so when Rabbi Tucker and I were talking about it, I, I, about what to do and what to talk about, and we were throwing around ideas about Israel, I just knew that Rabbi Tucker would be like the right person to maybe help those of us who, I think that's a lot of us, are really like every day it's like being in free fall with your eyes blindfolded. For me at least, you don't know what will be. Um, to help maybe give us some parameters and contours around our thinking and our emotions. Um, for those of you who don't know, Rabbi Ethan Tucker is a musmach of um, the Rabbanut. He is smicha from the Rabbanut. He is, has a doctorate in Tom and Rabbinics from JTS. He's a Wexner, Wexner graduate fellow, the author of a book with Rabbi Michael Rosenberg on egalitarian tefillah. He is the Rosh Yeshiva and Dean of Hadar Institute and a co-founder of Kihilat Adar. And in that respect, I am very lucky to get to work with him um, as I'm on the board of Kihilat Hadar and he is our Mara Da'atra and Halachic advisor, which uh, during the course of COVID came up quite a lot. Um, and so I feel really grateful of all times to have this opportunity for you to teach and for us to learn in honor of my father. Um, and honestly, all who are who have died um, and all who are injured, we should hopefully like pray that they should have a really a re true refuah shlema. Um, so with that, I, Rabbi Tucker, um, and this wasn't said, but for those of you in the room, could you please silent your phones, like really look and make sure? Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you to Emily for your introductory words, to your entire family for allowing us to honor uh, and elevate the soul of Dr. Eddie Sharfman, Zichron Bracha, as we gather here this evening. 
And I also want to thank the Lincoln Square Synagogue for enabling us to use this space for this special event. The format this evening is going to be one where I share thoughts in a lecture format for the first portion of the meeting of the evening. You have in front of you an outline of those remarks that's meant to help you keep pace as I take you through that initial presentation. And we'll then move to a question and answer period. Uh, as uh, Rabbi Comfer explained, uh, please write down questions, thoughts, challenges you have on the cards uh, that we distributed, uh, and we'll take a selection later on. Uh, even if we can't take a question, I will make sure to see all of them, and I am grateful in advance for how they'll help me sharpen my thinking. And I want to offer a final note before jumping into the content. Uh, a lot of times when I give a lecture, some of you have been at them, uh, the goal is to summarize months, if not years, of learning and poking around and thinking, offering a kind of precy uh, of what I've gathered from sources and traditions that I've probed. And tonight is a little bit different. You should think of it more as a suggested program of thinking in the years, months ahead. Not the culmination of several three-part series, but a plan for follow-up learning and teaching. And I want to emphasize that the ideas that I'm sharing tonight are very much what I am thinking, how I am responding to the current moment, my effort to solidify the truths that guide me. You'll hear a lot of first person in that. Uh, but I am, of course, hopeful that my own thinking will resonate more broadly uh, for this audience and maybe beyond and can it help at least some of us cultivate what I think needs to be a resilient vision for the unavoidably difficult times ahead. So I want to thank you for being here for that. How do we respond to moments of confusion, bewilderment, and fear? To moments when we're not sure of the way forward? To moments when perhaps we have questions about who we are and what would justify and guide our trajectory into the future? Those are some of the questions many of us have been asking since Simchat Torah. They're perhaps questions we've returned to as the human toll of the current war has grown, as hostages languish with the enemy for months on end, as both valiant soldiers and innocent children meet untimely deaths. The higher the price, the more critical it becomes to know what we are paying it for. I'm called back to an episode from the life of Yaakov, and the way it's processed in a few midrashim. And what we can only imagine was one of his deepest moments of pain and despair. Yaakov, who's staring down a threat from his brother, is ordered by his mother to flee to his uncle in the east. And in fear for his life, he leaves, unsure when, if ever, he will return. It's in that moment that Yaakov heads out for Haran. Vayetze Yaakov mi Beershava vayelech Harana, but he seems to be held up on the way. He encounters a place, a place that turns out to be only a few miles north of where he started. And one Midrash explains why the journey was interrupted. He ran into that place, he tried to pass, but the whole world became like a wall in front of him. Yaakov, the Midrash tells us, felt like the whole world, the entirety of physical space, was closing in on him. There was nowhere for him to escape. His plan for his life had been derailed. Can't manage to put one foot in front of another. Can't get to Haran, his intended destination, because he no longer knows how to move through the world. His birthright, his blessing, all of these are useless. He's fleeing hate and violence, and he has no one with him. That sense of loneliness and having nowhere to go, surprisingly, drives an encounter with God. And another Midrash develops the contours of this encounter further, spelling out how Yaakov prepared himself for this new, unexpected, unwelcome reality. And it builds off of details of the Bible's chronology. From the narrative details of the book of Genesis, I'll leave the exercise for you to do fully at home, it becomes clear that there are 14 missing years between Yaakov's departure and his arrival in Lavan's home. How do we account for those missing 14 years? Says the Midrash, he spent those 14 years immersed in the study hall of Ever, the grandson of Shem, and the great-grandson of Noah himself. 
Aver was the still surviving elder of the pre-Abrahamic generations, who was, according to biblical chronology, still alive and well when Yaakov is sent off to the east. Now, this is certainly a classic bit of rabbinic number crunching and loose end tying, but it's more than that. Because that 14-year gap could have been filled by the darshan with many things. It's an interpretive, a mythic, a strategic choice to put Yaakov in a context of study, of learning, of reconnection to elders and anchoring ideas in this moment of vertigo as he loses his sense of historical balance. The Midrash is telling us that the journey to Haran, perhaps even the sojourn in Beit El, was a 14-year process of reconnecting to first principles. Yaakov, in desperate need of a roadmap forward, must sort out for himself what he really believes, what is centrally important, how he will build a life guided by principle and not just fear. This has been very motivating for me in this moment, an effort to reconnect myself to what I understand to be a number of key truths and to be driven by principle and not just fear, to rearticulate for myself what lies behind the Jewish people's presence in our ancestral homeland in our current moment. And rather than tell you what you should think, I hope tonight to sketch out what I have come to feel we need to believe, what we need to hold in order to approach our current moment honestly and responsibly. This is an intense moment. There are existential threats to the Jewish people from monstrous enemies near and far that have not been felt in a few generations. Israeli society understands itself to be fighting for its life. Jews are also killing more people than we have since when? The Bar Kokhba rebellion? The Purim story? We don't have a recent experience of wielding this much life and death power over others. And so it makes sense that we're not always certain how to process it all. I won't really be speaking directly to the headlines or offering specific responses to detailed political questions. My intended scope tonight is broader than that. And it's based on a feeling that what we need in the current moment is not only political resolve, but religious perspective. I want this evening to offer you a description of four principles that feel centrally guiding to me. Even as I hope to make clear, they are not self-evident. They are all of them under questioning and assault in certain quarters, and it requires a meaningful degree of agency and even courage to adopt them. So here they are. Covenant. God's covenant with the Jewish people is eternal. And the Jewish people and its Torah are meant to be a permanent presence in history. Land. The Jewish people have forged an eternal connection with the land of Israel. And a combination of history and religious imperative privilege that land as the center of the Jewish world in the real time of history, not just in an imagined era beyond history. Power. Jews are ideally meant to hold power in that land in a way that enables them, as a majority, to shape their own destiny and the society in which they live. Without this power, Jewish life is incomplete. And responsibility. Jewish power is bound up with Jewish responsibility for all those who live under Jewish rule. And Jewish power is always bound up with the threat of exile and a return to powerlessness if we fail in our obligation to create an ideal society that is fair to all. Each of these can be supported or opposed through competing reads of our core text. And in each case, I want to explore the alternative reading, hold up the one I'm adopting, and explain what feels at stake. So let's begin. One of the first promises to Avraham is that he will be made into a nation. That destiny is re-articulated at Sinai with the mission of those present described as being a holy people, one whose practices will produce a sacred reputation 
that will resonate throughout the world. This is a people forged in a covenant with God, a covenant passed on to future generations by heredity. But is this promise eternal? Or can the Jewish people exit stage left from history? That possibility has been explored and even asserted time and again. And in fact, there are numerous moments in the tradition that can be read as the end of the divine Israel relationship. The act of mass apostasy at the foot of Mount Sinai, the worship of the golden calf, leads God to threaten erasure of the people. And even if Moshe intercedes and saves them, maybe that is mere forbearance with the people's eventual sunset being foretold. The details of the covenant at the plains of Moab, related in the last chapters of the Torah, determine that those who stray after other gods and reject God's standards will be separated out from Israel. Well, if the entire people turn to idolatry, as happened frequently in the pre-monarchic and monarchic period, does anything remain of the covenant? The destruction of the first temple represents the end of a promise. That seems to be the crash of a vision of a people living in God's land, with God dwelling among them in his earthly home. Isn't the destruction of the temple the end of that story, the final divorce of God from the people? Isn't the exile from the land and the destruction of Jewish self-rule God's abandonment of the divine side of the covenant? And doesn't it vitiate corollary Jewish obligations under the law? And even if all of that survived, isn't the destruction of the second temple the final death blow to the story of God in Israel? And isn't the subsequent exile of thousands of years, the ascendancy of Christianity and Islam, all proof of a broken covenant? Why shouldn't we view Israel's role in human history like that of Noah, who built a bridge from the broken world of the flood, but who becomes largely irrelevant and vestigial once we reach the next stage? So a lot of people have made those claims. Jews, Christians, Muslims, others alike. And they are certainly a sane way to read history. But if there's one thing that united all rabbinic Jews, beginning in the late Second Temple period and onwards, it was an agreement that the covenant between God and the Jewish people was eternal. Its laws eternally binding, the place of Jews in history non-negotiable. Rabbinic Jews hold that the sin of the golden calf was severe, but a bump in the road of a relationship that would recover. Individuals may be written out of the covenant for idolatry, but the collective whole will never fully abandon God and will never be abandoned. In the wake of the first exile, Isaiah rhetorically demands to see the bill of divorce that God had handed Israel. And rabbinic readers assert none such existed. Rabbinic traditions advanced biblical readings that supported the notion that the divine presence had simply gone into exile with the people, and that exile was not a severing of divine ties, but rather a new phase of relationship. It's most poignantly captured in this passage in Sifrei B'midbar, which is meant to be a reconstruction of a dialogue between the prophet Ezekiel and the first temple exiles. But it also serves as a standing rebuttal to any termination of Jewish covenantal history. The exiles come and say, Ezekiel, a slave who was sold by his master, is he not no longer in his domain? The prophet answers, yes. They say to him, well, since God has sold us off to the nations of the world, we are no longer in his domain. Said to them, Ezekiel, but what about a slave whose master sold him on the condition that he would come back and own him again. That is the state of the people in temporary breach with their relationship with God, but always in covenant. And all self-identifying Jews today sign on to this rabbinic interpretation. Even self-described secular Jews, at least those who don't see their destiny as one of assimilation and self-liquidation into a larger culture, believe in the eternity of the covenant in this sense. The Jewish people remain eternally relevant and vital. That's my first premise. What's the risk of taking the alternate path, aside from claiming it's a worse interpretation of both scripture and reality? Well, 
The alternate path here is the basic root of all anti-Semitism. The belief that the refusal of the Jews to be liquidated, whether by violence or assimilation, is one of the core perversions of the intended timeline of the universe and structure of society. And there are certainly many enemies of the Jewish people, religious and secular, who have believed and believe just that. We resist that when we say that ve'e'escha legoi gadol is an eternal promise. And for me, any theory of how Jews are meant to be in the world begins from the premise that we are, of course, meant to be. L'zarecha etrein et ha'aretz hazot. Eile ha'chukim ve'amishpatim asher tishmerun la'asot ba'aretz. Avram was also promised a piece of land, one meant to be given to his descendants. The Torah then goes on to speak about numerous mitzvot that seem like they only or primarily apply there. The people are clearly meant to enter the land from their desert wanderings. But what happens to the Jewish people if and when they are exiled? Even if we say the eternal covenant with God will never go away, is their existence then simply meant to be diasporic? Or does the land beckon them home indefinitely after each period of exile? There's a number of ways of trying to get at the answer to that question. How does the Torah speak about future events in Jewish history? Do we think there's an abiding obligation on individual Jews to live in the land of Israel? Are the mitzvot specific to the land in force when Jews return after intervening periods of exile? So probing all of that is beyond the scope of what we can do this evening, but I want to just open our eyes to how we might read the Torah in very different ways on this front. There are any number of elements in the Torah that are self-evidently not lidorot, not eternal commands to be observed throughout the generations. Is there an obligation every time someone's bitten by a snake to erect a copper serpent in view of the victim? Does every generation experiencing exile have to go through a period of subjugation in Egypt before re-entering the land? Must representatives of each tribe bring sacrifices on the first 12 days of a newly dedicated temple? The answer to all of those is no, even though all of them are prescribed in one way or another in the Torah. Might it not be the case that possessing the land was a one-time portion of the narrative of the formation of the Jewish people, but not a part of its essence? Just as the crucible of Egypt forged a key part of our identity, without any need to revisit it. Perhaps becoming a landed people for a period of history did the same, but without any post-exilic consequences. At first glance, the Torah itself seems to weigh in on this question in the passage from Dvarim on the page in front of you. After a period of exile, says the Torah, the people will return to God, and God will return them to the land gathering them from their diaspora back to the land that the ancestors inherited. That seems like a clear statement that the land exerts a pull on the people and they are meant always to return to it. But a number of rabbinic voices seem to have read this differently. One tradition appearing in the Babylonian Talmud and Shir Shirim Rabbah states that Israel took an oath not to ascend like a wall in large numbers to the land until the Messiah brings them home. And in parallel fashion, the Babylonian Amora Rav Yehuda condemned anyone who left Babylonia to live in the land of Israel. Some read the book of Nehemiah as reinforcing the notion that the land's relevance did not survive the exile. Because in the 10th chapter of that book, the returning Babylonian exiles commit themselves to observing the laws of the land including tithing one's produce and observing the sabbatical year. But they do so via an amana, a pact, that sounds like it was voluntarily accepted, not imposed upon them by the Torah. And indeed, Rabbi Elazar in the Yerushalmi says, Me'elehen kiblu alehen et hamasrot. The land-based mitzvot had lapsed during the exile. And what of the Torah's promise of a post-exilic inheritance? That, the Talmud says, is le'atid lavo, the far-off future. This places the return described in the Torah out of normal time 
into a post-historical supernatural future, suggesting a real-time diasporic destiny for Jews. But nonetheless, other voices resisted this term. Traditions in the Babylonian Talmud say that one who lives in the diaspora is like one with no God and that one should always live in the land of Israel, even in a thin and spiritually impoverished Jewish community, rather than live in a robust Jewish community in the diaspora, even Riverdale. <laughs> Going further and appealing to the tight correlation between the Torah's description of the ancestors' inheritance and the people's future inheritance, Rabbi Yosef Bar Hanina in the Yerushalmi states unequivocally that the possession of the land in the time of Ezra was just as effective, if not more so, to trigger full-blown obligation in all of the land-based mitzvot. Ma Yerushat avotecha midvar Torah, af Yerushatcha midvar Torah. All of these voices suggest an approach that holds the land remains a vortex for the Jewish people, inviting them in from the diaspora throughout their history. But if you read closely, and at Hadar we try to always read closely, you will note that the Torah actually only explicitly talks about one return from exile. Does it apply not only to those returning under Ezra and Nehemiah, but also to those who return after the destruction of the second commonwealth? There's in fact one rabbinic source that seems to suggest that maybe we get two bites at that apple and then land-based Judaism is over until the Messianic age. Seder Olam Rabbah. That verse from Deuteronomy 30, foretelling the return. It compares your inheritance to the inheritance of your ancestors. Just as all kinds of obligations were triggered when Joshua first conquered the land, so too all of that comes roaring back when Ezra returns. Could it be there will be a third inheritance that will work similarly? Talmud Lomar virishta, you shall inherit it once on return. You got the first and the second. Shlishit ein lachem. There is no third. Plain sense here would seem to be that the land is no longer renewed with spiritual and legal significance after the people have been twice exiled. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. The biblical narrative with respect to land has then run its course. And the covenant between God and the Jewish people then plays out in different ways. But in a remarkable read of this text, which seems to be driven by a conviction that the Jewish connection to the land is unshakable in real time, the Babylonian Talmud reads this text as saying, the second possession was so permanent that no third inheritance is necessary. The possession of the land at the time of Ezra, the decision to return after exile, which the Jewish people did not have to do, sealed the bond between the land and the Jewish people forever. Here's Rashi's concise narration of that reading. That is to say, they need not return and re-inherit it, because that second inheritance is enduring. The verse teaches us that the land's sanctity did not lapse with the exile of Titus, the Roman exile. These questions have remained live. And you have figures like the Ramban in the Middle Ages making a fervent claim that there's a biblical level obligation to live in the land. And that remains in effect even today as other interlocutors demur. And in more recent times, Rav Yol Teitelbaum, the central Satmar Rebbe in the 20th century, pushed hard for a reading of history that defers any collective Jewish residence in the land of Israel to the Messianic age. And he has his latter-day followers even today. I was raised to reject that reading. While questions regarding the precise degree of obligation to reside in the land or to observe its distinctive mitzvot, those remained open, Yeshuva Aretz, was understood to be an indisputable value. And indeed, even Rabbi Elazar, who I quoted earlier in the Talmud Yerushalmi, agreed that once the people had settled in the land, the mitzvot were minimally obligatory on a self-imposed level. 
And so the land was, at most, the biblically demanded point of return for the Jewish people throughout time, and at least the place we decided to irrevocably make our home. Texts speaking of oaths taken by the Jewish people not to come to the land en masse were either dismissed as non-normative or as vitiated when life in the diaspora became too dangerous. And here, the risks of rejecting this approach of a more diasporous turn in one way or the other are two. The first is that the diasporic condition has usually meant spending one's life under the domination of other powers and depending on them to treat Jews fairly and to leave them alive and well. And obviously one of the main motivators for political Zionism was the sense that that bargain was no longer tenable in Europe and after the Holocaust that the entire conception seemed rotten to the core. But the second is an intrinsic critique of diasporism itself, where diaspora sees something positive, whether for the Jews themselves or as a broader model for humanity in being geographically unbound, I think it is fair to ask, is this indeed a good way to live in the world? Even when the beckoning diaspora is America or other places where it feels there is a real promise of equality and citizenship for the Jews, such that they can be masters of their own fate in multi-ethnic and pluralistic societies, what are the costs of going through the world where the fundamental stories of your scripture are essentially, the fundamental places of the stories of your scripture are essentially imaginary, as opposed to places you visit and walk? Is the inevitable metaphorizing required for that containable, or will that dynamic ultimately metaphorize and historically contextualize many other elements in the Torah as well? At the end of the day, that's the path that I walk. Eretz Israel is the home that calls us back in real time. Our Jewish lives are fuller and more realized when we can connect to the land and its history, tell our 10-year-old kids that this stone was touched by someone a long time ago, and the mitzvot that are in force there. And over the better part of the last century, we've indeed returned en masse, such that it now contains the plurality of the world's Jews. That, to me, is mainly what settles the matter. The Jewish people has indeed returned to its ancient and reaffirmed home. Even if an eternal people has an eternal bond with a piece of land, the question of power remains. Is there a value or importance to being sovereign? Would it be enough to have some scattered Jewish farmers living pious lives in Eretz Yisrael? Or is there some mandate to have a state and to run a society? And if there is such a mandate, is it enduring? Avraham is promised that his progeny will include kings. And the Torah promises that Israel, when blessed, will rule rather than be ruled. But perhaps here too, we might have a case of an earlier phase in our development from which we have graduated. There are some good traditional bases for abjuring power. The Torah already seems to cast the request for a king as something elective, asima alai melech, and assimilationist, kechol goyim asher svibotai. In the book of Shmuel, the prophet excoriates the people when they act on this prerogative, telling them they have greatly sinned in preferring a human king to a divine monarch. And that was, in fact, the view of Rabbi Nehorai, one of the Tanaim, that Israel needs no king. And even if you follow the view of Rabbi Yehuda, which is favored by the Rambam, that the monarchy is a normative requirement, who is to say that this is an enduring feature of Jewish life? After all, the Amora Rabbi Hillel declared that there would be no future messianic king as the golden age of the monarchy was already achieved in the time of King Chizkiyahu. You can clearly stitch together a form of divine anarchism from these and other sources, recognizing, like Lord Acton, that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But it's also worth not going overboard on this point. Whatever nervousness the Tanakh has about the monarchy, and it has it in spades, that does not extend to a system of government headed up by elders and an extensive court system supported by some form of enforcement. 
And the pater familias, of course, had tremendous powers. There's plenty of sovereignty to be found in the biblical system under any read. Even in the rabbinic world, in which meaningful power has been reduced to a fantasy, it is nonetheless something they fantasize about. And rabbinic sources encode a longing for a more complete Jewish polity in everyday practice. The canonical text of the Amidah, recited three times a day, directs us to pray for the ingathering of the exiles and then for the restoration of a just Jewish government. Hashiva shoftenu kivarishona. Way before we start talking about the Messiah in Etzemach David. Every time we eat a meal, we confront the halacha propounded by a number of Talmudic sages, kol she'eno omer malchut beit David bebonei Yerushalayim, lo yatsa yedei chovato. You must mention the kingdom of the monarchy of David every time you talk about Jerusalem in the grace after meals. Without doing so, you have not fulfilled, fulfilled your obligation. Now sure, you can imagine that to be a requirement to hope for the messianic restoration beyond time. But consider the following insight by Rabbi Yirmiyahu Lev, a 19th century Hungarian rabbi, as to what may lie at the heart of this liturgical requirement. And I thank my student Akiva Mattinson for drawing my attention to this source. He argues that Rabbi Hillel, that sage who denied a future messiah, certainly could not have committed what Maimonides later classified as a core heresy to deny the coming of the Messiah. No, the Messiah is surely coming. Rabbi Hillel merely felt that the future redemption would be entirely at the hands of God. In contrast, these sages insisted that the redemption would come via earthly rulers who would bring that redemption. Mentioning Beit David each time we dream of a rebuilt Jerusalem is meant, according to Rabbi Lev, to inculcate in us a stubborn sense of the human agency that would be required to achieve that restoration. The need for a king in real time lives on. And there's another dimension to wielding power, which is the sheer dignity of having control of your own destiny and being able to shape a society in keeping with your values and priorities. This is captured in a highly unusual passage in the Rambam when he is explaining the reasons for celebrating Hanukkah. He relates the awful religious persecution by the Greeks, the violations of Jewish property, dignity, and sanctity, how the Hasmoneans fought back, killing the enemy and saving the Jewish people. And then he adds, Vehemidu melech mina koanim, and they set up a king from among the priests, and the kingship returned to Israel for more than 200 years until the second temple was destroyed. Now this is an odd detail, because what good is a king from the line of priests as opposed to from the Davidic line? And that 200-year period he's reflecting on includes the Herodians, a number of whom were highly corrupt and whose Jewish lineage was suspect. But the message upon reflection is clear. There was and is dignity in having sovereignty, even when imperfect, even when not in keeping with some ideal set of messianic norms. Jewish life is more complete when it is present not only in the form of individual observances, but influence over the public space. Abjuring power risks losing all of these important dimensions. And, on some level, these dimensions are all supplementary to the main function of governmental power, which is to protect a country's citizens. In a world in which there is power, the Torah reminds us that you will either rule or be ruled. For all that went deeply wrong with the Israeli army's response on October 7th, there is one reason and one reason only that there were 1,200 Jewish dead that day and not 12,000 or 120,000. And that is because there was a Jewish army. That army continues to fight an enemy that keeps young children hostage underground. One 
where reports continue to emerge of sexual assaults on its female prisoners on a daily basis. The risks of not embracing Jewish power are not only a potential misread of the Jewish textual tradition and the arc of Jewish history. The risks start and extend to mortal danger to flesh and blood Jews today who need, unfortunately, arms and force to protect themselves from those who would do them harm and who would promise to continue to do so. But nonetheless, my whole premise this evening has been to push us beyond the immediately political and necessary to think more broadly about the ideal architecture of Jewish society. And it's those ideals that ultimately give us motivation, focus, and endurance Whereas our ability to sustain more contingent structures can wax and wane with the intensity of the need and the intensity of the opposition to it. Personally, I have only become clearer in recent months that I don't want a world without Jewish power. And I believe that a strong strand in our tradition reminds us that malchut, in the broad sense of Jewish sovereignty and responsibility at the societal level, is a good thing, a blessing of which we pray to be worthy. When I say Hallel with a full heart on Yom Ha'atzmaut each year, this is a pretty good summary of what I'm feeling. A restored vitality to the Jewish people returned to their land with the power to defend themselves and to create something profound based on Jewish language, rhythm, and values. Am Yisrael chai v'chihu moshel b'chol eretz kenan v'yafog libo ki lo ha'emin bahem. It's hard to believe it's always hard for me to understand, emotionally and intellectually, how anyone could not be starstruck by this dramatic turn in history. It's the most dramatic reversal of fortune one could imagine. B'shuv Hashem et shivat Zion hayinu kecholmim. In that sense, the creation of the State of Israel in 1948 and much of what it has accomplished since have been a realization of these first three ideas that I have described. The Jewish people affirming an eternal covenant and taking a turn to restore a connection to land and to power that had largely been lost. Chazra Malchut L'Israel. Ki yedativ leman asher yitzaved banav et peito acharav v'shamru derech Hashem la'asot tzedaka u'mishpat. Torah achat u'mishpat echad yihye lachem v'lager hagar itchem. Avraham, however, is not just the progenitor of kings. He's singled out by God to produce a people who will guard God's ways in justice and fairness. The reality of Jewish power in the land thus also represents a gauntlet throne with respect to the fourth idea I've laid out here. Jewish power and presence on the land in our tradition never comes without responsibility. If one is going to be sovereign, one must provide and care for all those who are under one's control. The Torah could not be more clear on this. There is one law, one standard for all who live under you. Yes, that law includes provisions for idolaters, murderers, others who long to destroy you and the foundations of society. But one cannot be a sovereign and look out only for the Israelite, for the Jew. That is then to engage in an act of self-protection, but not to function truly as a sovereign. The entire vision of Jewish power in the Torah is one that will undo the perversions of Egypt. They oppress the gerim, you will treat them as equals. More intensely, Jewish power in our tradition never has legitimacy without accountability. Put simply, there is no sovereignty without the threat of exile. There have always been voices that have yearned for this immunity, longed for the stability of power without the need to fulfill the charge with which it comes. <coughs> Those who hope to see in the divine grace of national strength a sort of total and final vindication that puts Jewish well-being on autopilot. That is a kind of heresy and idolatry of its own. It's manifest in too many contemporary Jewish voices, 
ones who want power without responsibility, who imagine that the very institutions of Jewish independence are self-validating without reference to any other moral compass. Those voices confuse the noble enterprise of governing with the meaner aspects of self-preservation. This malady was already called out by the prophet Jeremiah, which with your permission, I will read in full in the original. Ko amar Adonai tzvaot Elohei Yisrael, heitivu darchechem umal lechem, vashakna etchem bamakom hazeh. Al tiftechu lachem el divrei ha-sheker lemor, heichal Adonai, heichal Adonai, heichal Adonai hema. Ki im heitiv, teitivu, et darchechem ve et malalechem. Im aso ta'asu mishpat, bein ish u bein re'ehu, ger yatom ve'almana lo ta'ashoku, ve'gdam naki al tishpechu bamakom hazeh. ואחרי אלוהים אחרים לא תלכו לרע לכם. ושיכנתי אתכם במקום הזה, בארץ אשר נתתי לאבותיכם למין עולם ועד עולם. הנה אתם בוטחים לכם על דברי השקר לבלתי הועיל. הגנוב רצוח ונעוף והישבע לשקר וכתר לבעל והלוך אחרי אלוהים אחרים אשר לא ידעתם ובאתם ועמדתם לפניי בבית הזה אשר נקרא שמי עליו ואמרתם ניצלנו. למען עשות את כל התועבות האלה, המרת פריצים היה הבית הזה אשר נקרא שמי עליו בעיניכם, גם אנוכי הנה ראיתי, נאום אדוני. כי לכו נא אל מקומי אשר בשילה, אשר שיכנתי שמי שם בראשונה, וראו את אשר עשיתי לו, מפני רעת עמי ישראל. ועתה, יען עשותכם את כל המעשים האלה, נאום אדוני, ואדבר עליכם, השכם, ודבר, ולא שמעתם. ואקרא אתכם ולא עניתם. ועשיתי לבית אשר נקרא שמי עליו, אשר אתם בוטחים בו, ולמקום אשר נתתי לכם ולאבותיכם, כאשר עשיתי לשילה. והשלכתי אתכם מעל פניי, כאשר השלכתי את כל אחיכם, את כל זרע אפרים. Jeremiah asserts that the temple of God and the dominion it represents is not a talisman that protects from harm. The land is not a birthright that can never be taken away. These are instead places, places and institutions that indicate trust, God's belief in us that we can do great things if we are well grounded, given stability and the tools of power. If, however, we violate that trust, it can, in fact, must all be taken away. Jewish power properly understood, thus always lives in the shadow of the dread of exile. And that makes sovereignty a fraught business, to put it mildly. And in fact, there are those who confront Jeremiah's language and can easily decide it is best to walk away from the whole thing. And we have a number of our ancestral sages who said exactly that, choosing their own version of avoiding responsibility. Sanhedrin 98b reports that Ula said, May the Messiah come, but may I not see him. <laughs> and so said Rabbah, and so said Rabbi Yochanan. Why exactly, Rabbi Yochanan, why exactly did these sages say they didn't want to see the restoration of Jewish power? So the Talmud actually goes on in that passage to provide an answer. When Israel's return to its land, there will be conflict and there will be pain. The glorious rebirth of the Jewish people and their return to the world stage and to politics will involve pain for others and for them, and most notably, pain for God, who is committed to Israel's restoration, but loves all of humanity. These sages did not want to see this, neither the restoration nor the pain it would bring in its wake. The sages in this passage offer one solution to the emotional dilemma here, avoid seeing. And for some, then and now, the price of Jewish national restoration and human pain is more than they can bear. These sages preferred to defer the messianic dream, to come to terms with political displacement and diminishment, rather than live in a world of human and divine pain on Israel's account. That is no longer an option, not for anyone responsibly confronting the reality of the world in which we live. 
Put simply, whereas Ula, Rabbah, and Rabbi Yochanan might have been able to wish off seeing the restoration of Israel, we have seen too much to take that approach. And there therefore must be a way to embrace with joy and gratitude our return to the land and power while recognizing that we have more moral responsibility than we have ever had before, and that is as it should be. In this regard, I find more helpful the view of another sage in that sugya. Rav Yosef said, Let the Messiah come, and may I merit to sit in the shade of his donkey's dung. Rav Yosef rejects the approach of his colleagues and longs to see the Messiah. He is aware, however, that the donkey on which the Messiah will ride into our world has some less than pleasant byproducts. In seriousness, we will kill people. And even when we do so in a just war as part of self-defense, we will need a vision for emerging from the death and the destruction. When we kill innocents, even in cases where we feel there is little alternative, We are responsible for causing God pain. If, God forbid, we were to torture prisoners for spite or lose our ethical compass, we have to hold ourselves to account. None of this dung dampened Rav Yosef's enthusiasm for Israel's restoration, but he will not sanitize it either, nor should we. That's where I sit and what I firmly believe is our challenge. A look at the long arc of history reveals that our age is one in which there has been a miraculous reversal of fortune of the Jewish people, one that invites us to gratitude and compels us to own this moment. But it is also fair to say that we have still not fully taken responsibility for all that this new power entails. And there is plenty of shade under the enormous pile of dung that those miraculous events have created. We need to be able to understand that God rejoices in the rebirth of the Jewish people and is also in pain when any of his creatures suffer. And we must expand our hearts and minds to hold those divine emotions together ourselves. This journey back to earlier texts and truths that are guiding me has not taken 14 years, though I'm sorry if it felt like it did. And we don't have that long to find our religious focus in the moment. But I am hopeful that sharing my own thinking in this moment can help at least some of us to get unstuck, not to feel that the whole world is like a wall in front of us. We are the descendants of Yaakov, yes, but we are also descendants of Avraham, the bearers of great promises and a lofty destiny. We sit at a remarkable, unexpected, painful, but also uplifting moment in our history. May we be worthy of our eternal covenant, our ancestral and current homeland, the privileges, dignity, and weighty responsibilities of power, and never forget that our ultimate purpose is not mere self-preservation, but to serve as conduits for God's justice on earth. Thank you. We're going to move to some questions. I think we might have some that are coming in from online, and then we're going to uh, collect cards from the room. I'm going to turn it over to Mara. While we are waiting um, for the questions here, um, we're going to start with one question from Ahuva on Zoom, who asked, how can there be a Jewish state that does not favor Jews and treats everyone equally? How, how, can you, how can you help us navigate? Um, how can you help us navigate this? Yeah, I mean, that's been a question that's being asked, been asked for a long time, and I'm not going to come up with some new answer uh, tonight. I think people know the general contours around that question of questions of demographics and, uh, you know, land trades and swaps and all kinds of other uh, solutions that are proposed. I think holding my ground of not making political recommendations but offering religious perspective, you cannot have um, a state that is recognized as a manifestation of 
the promise of power to the Jewish people that does not hold itself accountable to caring for everyone under its rule in a basically equal way. That's just not, it's not defensible to claim that uh, the, the character that is held by the figure of the ger in the Tanakh, uh, which is to say someone who is an equal presence on your land with you, nonetheless not a part of your nation, uh, gets to be treated differently. Um, now, you know, there are aspects of, uh, of the Jewish character of the state, um, which of course are a kind of response to the long arc of discrimination, displacement, colonization, all kinds of various dynamics against Jews that are the reason that there's an effort to create a space that will, like when you have you know, an Endangered Species Act that protects certain species among, uh, above others because of their history of uh, dwindling and being under attack, there are going to be things that are going to advance uh, aspects of you know, Jewish language, Jewish interest, et cetera, uh, that are going to reflect that character. But the Torah brings us back, I think, in the language of mishpat and basic issue of laws, fairness, et cetera. You cannot have some conscious regime where you think the job of the sovereign is to play favorites among the people uh, who live there on the basic details of what it is to live the life day to day. That's what I'll say is the answer to that one. What else? Thank you for the question. Yeah. Great. Um, we have a bunch of wonderful questions. Are there clear examples in Tanakh of biblical Israelites showing moral responsibility for the care of other nations' well-being? Yeah, I guess we're not going to necessarily get full clarification. If we mean other nations like in a corporate form or we mean as individuals, um, I guess I'll, I'll interpret it as I see fit. Um, well, one of the interesting things, I mean, if you go back to sort of first temple narratives, there are certainly people of other nations who are, they're members of David's army, they are, you know, allies in all kinds of different ways. Yishai Rosen Svi has actually done some important and interesting work on this in his scholarship of the ways in which a later binary, which is familiar to people from rabbinic literature, of there are Jews and non-Jews, right? And even that term, non-Jew, to refer to a person is a very odd way, right, of talking about someone, um, is a reflection of a, a later binary that emerges that if you're talking about biblical sources, it's more a picture of there's 70 nations. Some of them are nice to you. Some of them are mean to you. Some of them you have treaties with. Some of them you're at war with. Some of them you're connected to family-wise, like Midian, these Moshe and his wife, and then you also sometimes go to war with them and you're back and forth. Um, so I think a complex picture emerges there just in terms of who are the characters on the map. Uh, I'll say this, there is one very powerful passage um, which speaks more to questions of reputation, what it means to cultivate a certain kind of reputation, um, where there is a described group of non-Israelites um, who are trying to figure out how to gain protection for themselves in a given moment. And they say, let's go and talk to the kings of Israel because we hear they are malche chesed. They are kings that manifest kindness to people who come to them in a moment of vulnerability. That is, I think, actually uh, speaks even louder than a specific event, what are all the things that had to lead up to the non-Israelite characters in that story saying, oh, let's go seek out the Israelites. They're going to actually protect us and give us shelter. Um, I would want to think more about right, what are the things you, you can do uh, in order to cultivate that kind of reputation. Um, I'll leave it at that. Other questions? Yeah. More, and thanks for bearing with. We decided to do it this way in terms of making sure we just had a sort of fair representation of people who don't feel like they can easily shut up their hand. But I recognize there's a little bit less of the dynamic of like the back and forth. Yeah. I'll try to be as dynamic as possible. Yeah, you'll be like um, stand. You'll be standing. Right. So now, now pretend I'm Jeffrey from Illinois, um, <laughs> who asks, what does it mean to hold ourselves accountable for mistakes or misdeeds as part of the exercise of power? Is there a specifically Jewish way of being able to think about this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. And again, I'll underscore with everything I'm saying, what I said at the beginning, 
you know, this is, this is my sketching of how I'm thinking through language I'm trying to develop. I'm not claiming to have a full Mishnah Sdura, uh, a full lineup of answers to everything that's asked. Uh, so I appreciate your indulgence with that. Um, say, just give me the formulation one more time so I get the sure. response right. What does it mean to hold ourselves accountable for mistakes or misdeeds as part of the exercise of power? Yeah. So look, the first thing you do is you acknowledge mistakes and misdeeds when you do them, when you make them, right? Um, in other words, if I were to say what it doesn't look like, it doesn't look like treating every failure that you are accused of um, as ipso facto a malicious act of anti-Semitism, okay? That I think is fair to say. Now, that depends who says it. If the person who says it you have no reason to assume, you have no indications that they have your best interests at heart, you may take that criticism with a grain of salt, but actually what it means to be a sovereign, a responsible power, is to acknowledge, yeah, I mostly try to do what I'm intending to do and to do what I understand to be good with my power and when I mess up, or when people under my control mess up, they're gonna be investigated, they're gonna have consequences. Uh, some of the more, you know, violent aberrations that we've seen um, in various uh, Jewish quarters in the last, uh, you know, how you can put the timeline wherever you want to you wanna put it uh, in terms of some of that, the peak of, uh, you know, more violent and uh, abusive behavior, whether it's in the West Bank or other areas, those things have to be responded to, right, and owned. Um, I, you know, what are the right ways? I'm not sure the Jewish state is any different from how we think of how states in general are supposed to have accountability on that front. There's all kinds of things. You can have commissions of inquiry. You can have, uh, you know, uh, endeavors of reconciliation, uh, any number of different ways of doing it. But I actually think the thing that's most important to me, and I think part of what I tried to build out with this framework tonight, for me, for me, this very much sort of works in a, in a sequence. <laughs> Um, in other words, I'm not saying you, you, know, you pull out any block, the block that follows necessarily collapses, but in my mind there's a kind of building up. You have a sense of you're meant to be here in the world. You have a sense that there's a place that you are from and you are meant to be from. There is then a trust that you're given over that space, and once you actually are confident about that in a certain way, you are then able you should be able to then, with a certain degree of maturity, interrogate the use of that power when it feels like it goes off the rails. I think some of what can be difficult in contemporary conversations about this is when critiques of uh, the use of Jewish or Israeli power feel like they're just actually ciphers for litigating whether there should be Jewish power at all, or whether Jews should be on the land at all, or sometimes whether Jews should just go away and leave us all alone, well then it becomes hard to actually have the mature, but I also think totally morally and religiously critical conversation of uh, asking ourselves, are we meeting our responsibilities? So we're going to turn to a question of prophets and kings. Okay. Okay. So if historically prophets, prophets and kings have been in fierce conflict, right? So the, the prophets are marginalized and we as readers are actually encouraged to view them as heroes. So the question is, how can we make space for the prophetic voices today that are calling attention to the things that warrant our attention without becoming like our ancestral kings and their followers? Mm -hmm. Great question. Great question. Um, I, I once was having a conversation with a prominent figure in, uh, in Jewish studies and public life. I'm, I'm not going to say who it was. It's, it's not important. Um, but I remember speaking to her and, you know, we were having some exchange, I forget what it was, but it was something like this. And I was sort of in the side of the conversation that was like, well, you know, but like the Nevi'im would demand like X, Y, and Z. And she said, I hate the Nevi'im. <laughs> right? And I was like, you can't say that, right? I mean, that's like, a, that's a non-negotiable. You have to love the Nevi'im, you can't hate them. Um, I'm not sure so many people love them, right? How many people wanted to go out to dinner with your Mio? I'm not sure. Um, as you saw from the passage we read, it didn't exactly make people feel great. But this, but this actually goes to the point, I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately, because 
Actually, one thing, one of the things that is the most striking um, about um, the Nevi'im is their no holds barred critique, right? And their willingness to basically say, you are so wicked, your entire society is going to be pulled down brick by brick, and you're going to be cast off to an impure land and die there. I mean, they say stuff like that all the time, right? There's no, uh, there's no sense of uh, any holding back of or, well, you know, because I'm on your side, I can't, I can't say mean things about you. So um, there, there, that is a, a huge part of our tradition, right? Like a searing critique. But I will also say to you honestly, where I find there to sometimes be a gap, often I find there is a gap between the dynamic of the Nevi'im in Tanakh um, and a certain mode of contemporary critique, whether it's of Israel or Jewish power, is the Nevi'im, even at their most vicious, there's always like 2% of their Facebook posts that are, I love you so much. And I just want you to know, even though you're terrible, you're, you're going to come back. It's going to be OK. Even when they say you're going to be deported to a horrible land and suffer. But on the other end of it, God is going to bring you back. And I think it's not incidental that the most vitriolic of the Nevi'im, um, I mean, basically all the Nevi'im, Chezkel is really the only exception, um, they live with the people. They don't critique them from some other environment, some other threat assessment on their daily life. When Yirmiyahu says, you're all going to be deported, he's also talking about himself. <laughs> and that goes to something deep that I don't know how we cultivate, but it feels like it has to be cultivated better. One of the things that feels we have a deficit around sometimes in our, sometimes, a lot of times in the discourse around this, I actually think really boils down to questions of trust. Do you trust that the person either leveling a critique at you or repelling a critique actually has your interests in mind or actually shares your sense of existential dread, et cetera? Now, sometimes I actually think that is present and we are just totally out of practice or distorted by the way we communicate now from enabling people to hear the fullness of what we're walking around with. Um, you know, I even think about like a, a, a talk like I gave tonight, like, how do you put this on Instagram? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> okay. Um, but at, at best, right, what would you do at best? At best, you would break it up into four slides, someone would see the fourth slide, would then share that a million times, the algorithm filters out the second slide, and suddenly, oh, that's what I think, right? Part of what's sort of, I think, brilliant and powerful, particularly in the way Chazal curated, it's not even Chazal, it's really like the Jewish liturgical tradition curated the Nevi'im, was when you read a Haftarah, it's always that balance, right? When it's a prophet, when it's not a narrative haftarah, it's like there's a good amount of yelling at you, and then it always ends, even if it has to skip two chapters, <laughs> right? But it's actually profound. They will skip two chapters to make sure it ends with a sense of, but I just want you to know, like, we're in this together. You get that, right? That is something that I think the Nevi'im didn't actually, you know, the conflict with the Malachim, I think the kings often didn't have that trust in the Nevi'im, right? They were worried about that. But the Nevi'im honestly read, and certainly in the way that we should not hate them, but we should love them, um, combine that. So I don't know exactly how to, like, direct us to do that better, but I feel like we can do that better and we must do that better. And in a certain way, the Nevi'im and our appropriation of them can be a model. Great. We're going we're gonna to take one more that's sort of a mashup between uh, on, on Zoom, Jeff from Connecticut, um, and also someone in, the, uh, someone in the room, although there were a number of questions that sort of connected to the, um, to the last piece about responsibility. Mm -hmm. 
So take these two and, and mash them as you as you will. Great. Um, given the requirement to rule responsibly, what ob what obligation do Jews have to oppose those leaders who do not do that? Mm -hmm. Right. And and uh, and a and a and a second piece in terms of of responsibility um, uh, is when looking at a situation where we or some might sort of lose their ethical compass. Um, how how from the diaspora can we exert power to take seriously moral responsibility? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll start with the second one. It's hard to do that from the diaspora. A couple of people, when thinking, helping me sort of think through some of the things of this talk or this evening or, you know, how to talk it through, uh, you know, they said, they're like, who's your audience? Like, who are you talking to? Who are you trying, to the extent you're even trying to convince, which I wasn't really in that mode for the most part, um, at least that's not how I thought of it. Um, who are you speaking to? And at least one person said, well, I think you should actually just be very clear you're speaking to a diaspora audience, not just in fact, but in terms of where that will be um, effective and appropriate. So I didn't offer that caveat at the beginning because I don't like to overly frame what people are going to hear, what they're going to hear, it'll land how it will hear. But now that there's a follow-up question, <laughs> right? Um, I do think that in, in some fair, basic way, look, I was just in Israel for a week. We're visiting our son who's there studying for a gap year. Um, and uh, we had planned that trip before. It was a very different trip than we imagined. Um, one of the most profound things I took away, I'd say the peak moment of this, was being in the square outside the Tel Aviv Art Museum, known now as Kikar HaChatufim, where you have the whole uh, the table set up with empty places and um, tents and different communities there from the, you know, the Gaza uh, envelope being represented. Um, I think the thing I was most overwhelmed by was this is a different planet in terms of current experience, orientation, um, people's children, you know, being off, not knowing if they'll return, um, sense not just of like in a solidarity with the Jewish people way, but just inner family relations, which people in this room have those relationships across the sea also, like I understand that. But if you talk about the society, like at the end of the day, no matter how agitated I am about this moment, when I'm waking up in New York City, I'm just not all in it. Um, and they are all in it. And there is a certain political analog um, to not, you know, running afoul of the charge not to be like Chavre Iov, uh, Job's friends, who show up with their very fancy uh, moral and religious philosophy, which actually seems to hew with basic biblical theology and theodicy, and basically seems like they're right. Um, but God basically at the end of the book tells them, can you just shut up? <laughs> and Chazal in the Mishnah basically say, yeah, they're the model for that person who shows up when you're in pain and instead of focusing on your pain is giving you the theory of why this happened, right? It's the, it's that, it's the Shiva visit gone awry where that guest comes and gives their theory of why whatever is happening is for the best or this or that, okay? I want to emphasize, though, like, you know, Eliphaz and the other friends of Eov, it actually doesn't mean they're wrong. That is to say, there are certain moments when there are truths that can't be heard. I remember for me, this was uh, my, my father teaching this to me, a totally different context, um, but I remember asking him, I don't know, I think it was a teenager. Uh, I was like, why is it, why does everyone completely freak out when someone says the Holocaust was because the Jewish people sinned? Okay? Among those people like the Satmar Rebbe, who I quoted earlier. Okay? Like, why? We say umipnei chata'enu galinu meretzenu all the time. We were exiled because of our sins. Like, horrible things, massacres. Like, why? And he just said to me, 
Chavrei Yov. You, there are still survivors alive. There are children of survivors. He's like, there might also be a problem with the theology, but sure, you want to tell me in 400 years people are going to say the Holocaust was because of our sins, like that might fly, but it can't fly when it's still in the rearview mirror. So there's some aspect of just sort of knowing where are you located. If you actually care about someone, when is the moment where you can receive a message or deliver a message to them that will help them, as opposed to making them feel abandoned? I think one of the things I've been surprised by, I sort of knew it intellectually, but I was still surprised by the degree of vulnerability and terror of abandonment in the current moment that most Israelis walk around with is shockingly overwhelming um, and to the point where things that feel like they don't count for anything count a huge amount. You know, the number of people who just when I was there, quite frankly, in a self-serving way, visiting my own kid who was there on a gap year, you know, who are like, Kamatov Shatapo. Wow, like so amazing that you came. Like that means so much that you're here. And I was sort of like, I, I feel bad almost taking that compliment, but okay, like if that presence does it. So my, my first answer to that is sort of just sensitive. You know, what are you trying to do, right? When you offer a critique, this is always a question, whether it's on an interpersonal level, it's on a political level, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to carve out a space for your own integrity but actually you don't really care how it affects someone else well then kind of do whatever you want to do or need what you need to do and you don't really care if it'll rupture your relationship with them what's the point in giving guidance or are you trying to actually affect someone or make them behave differently then you have to be very sensitive right to who is in a position to make that received that's part one right part two i think is just to emphasize though um well, of course you have to critique people who you think are doing things wrong. You at least have to hold and develop the critique and figure out how you're going to offer it, how you're going to be in solidarity with the people you want to be involved with. Uh, I think for a lot of diaspora Jews, the way it makes sense is to find the Israeli allies and counterparts who are thinking or processing in the way you are doing that. There are certainly many people who were on those kibbutzim, who were massacred on October 7th, who are no fan of the current government and do not keep that private. But there, and particularly its head, but there is a huge difference <laughs> between their positionality and someone you know, firing off a social media post uh, from, let's say, not not being located in the same proximity that Yirmiyahu was located in when he did that. Um, but let's remember, being the king of Israel does not give Ahav any immunity, right? That is to say, the fact that you hold a position of authority um, just means you actually have more responsibility. Uh, I think it's hard, right? It's, you know, I just went to one of the things, we tried to do a few things while, while we were there, went to the, uh, the Begin Center in uh, Jerusalem um, and saw the exhibit there for the first time. Um, and Begin, of course, as people know, is a very uh, controversial figure in all kinds of ways. He was a hero to many, many people, including my, my great aunt who loved him more than any Jewish leader you could ever imagine. Um, and was also you know, seen by many in Israeli society as leading, uh, leading the country in the wrong direction. And obviously there were a lot of things Begin did in office that people didn't exactly uh, expect, like the Camp David Accords, et cetera. Um, but one of the things that was, that was very striking, I think the museum played this up. It's not a, you know, it's a hagiographic display. Um, but, you know, with enough knowledge of history, you can also see the things where you just see, yeah, but no, but that was, that was right. Like, they're really highlighting something true here. Um, you know, Begin's commitment to rule of law, um, to actually being willing to be backed down by the courts on a number of occasions, um, and a sense of being committed to an enterprise that is larger than your personal success in a given moment, um, that's essential. And to my mind, like much more, <laughs> I mean, much more, we don't have to get into, you know, comparables, but 
um, one of the major, major weakness points of uh, the current Israeli government and the current prime minister is people just don't have the confidence about what is and what is not being pursued for self-interest. Yes. And that is devastating for building up a sense of, okay, we're in this together, we're going to put this aside, we're going to put that aside, because we all know we're rowing in the same direction. Um, and that is a particularly corrosive thing in a certain moment. So, I, you know, I, I think I am not in favor at all uh, we've had a couple things. I don't know how many people have had like tension on their family chats. We've had a couple, <laughs> couple tensions on our family WhatsApp group, you know, where it was like one person said some like derogatory thing, you know, about the prime minister. And then someone else was like, how dare you say that, you know, in a time of war and this and that. Um, then I like, I like privately yelled at like several people and I was like, please don't talk about this right on this chat. This is for photos and other things. Um, <laughs> but, but there was a sense there of, right, I, I was certainly, I didn't think any of it was actually appropriate for that family chat, but you, like, you are not obligated to somehow lavish praise um, on people you feel are making the wrong decisions. Um, Adaraba, you have to have some clarity of the ways in which they're failing. But then I want to come back, right? If you're actually in relationship with people and you are not just trying to score political points for whatever, I'm not even sure what the political points are being scored for sometimes, how's it going to be heard? By whom? To what end? Um, and that we could use a lot more of. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. A quick couple of words of, of gratitude. First, Rabbi Ethan Tucker, thank you for letting us into your thinking. I think there are many of us looking forward to continuing these conversations with you. Um, huge gratitude to the entire Sharfman family for being able to bring us together and to be able to, to spend this time learning, uh, learning in memory. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us here and to the, uh, to the many, many people on Zoom from all, all over the world. Um, we hope that you will continue to learn with us this winter in our in-person classes and our virtual classes. Uh, for those of you in the room, you can head to www.hadar.org to view our full slate of winter classes. Zoom links are getting dropped into the uh, Links are getting dropped into the chat for those on Zoom. Um, but I do want to especially highlight um, our three-part virtual winter lecture series with Dina Weiss that will begin on February 13th called Pleasure and Pain. We look forward to many more opportunities to be able to learn together. Thank you all so, so very much. Travel safe to get home tonight. <laughs>